We're talking about cancer, but in a whole new way, with two people who have an unusual and special take on this problem. Stay tuned. Watching Profunda TV with host Phyllis Haynes. So I wanted to talk to two people who I think have a broad understanding of the subject as well as personal experience. Um, both Label Braun and Minx Boren are two individuals who have lived their lives giving to others, helping others, guiding others, coaching others working in an industry, in Label's case, where his mind was put to task to run huge projects. Uh, Minx is masterful in the area of nutrition and coaching specifically, uh, an incredible mind. Both these individuals have what I consider limitless possibilities for the human mind and expression. What has cancer been in your life? What is it to your life? That's the question I'm starting with. Interesting question. Thank you. The first word that comes up is journey. It's not a definitive point in time. In my languaging of it, I never say that I have cancer. I say that I am dealing with cancer in my body. So I own it in a different way. And I think that language is very important. What has it meant to me? What has it been about for me? This journey started, I was diagnosed four years ago in the middle of COVID. There were all kinds of extra stresses because of that. And my first question to myself was not why me, because why not me? I'm part of the human condition and goodness knows there are enough reasons or theories of reasons as to why someone might develop cancer. My only question, well, my first question was, how do I want to show up? And as I asked myself that question, the little voice in my head said, you already wrote the book on it. Just follow your own advice. I had written a book called Decades of Gratitude, Gusto, Grit, and Grace, which are coach stories, coach stories about my own life. And those four elements showed up everywhere. What they became for me for the last four years between the original diagnosis and then a recent diagnosis six months ago that it had metastasized the question became, how do I show up with gratitude? For gratitude for everything that comes my way every day, the blessings that are always there. Uh, gusto, a certain level of enthusiasm rather than um, just wallowing in it. Grit, because you need a lot of it to go through a cancer journey. And grace, grace in the sense of showing up with as graciously and gracefully as I can, and a certain sense of grace that there is something larger than me that I am connected with, and that I am not making this journey alone. Well, that's a good place to start. Um, Label, I'm going to ask you the same question. What is cancer in your life? Well, part of what cancer in my life is discovering what the deepest connections in my life have been. I mean, Minx, I love the phrase, you constantly use journey mates. And there are friends and there are journey mates, people who are deeply intertwined on um, each other's journey. Um, I believe I got the cancer first and uh, you were there for me and then you got the cancer and I was uh, there for you. But I couldn't imagine making this journey um, without significant people in my life. And that includes you, Phyllis. I mean, the, the, the support you've given me has been so important. But there, the question then also comes up, what do I do now? That was my first inkling. What is going to be the shape of my journey with cancer? And part of the, what I had to do was to figure out who 
am I living for? So it became really important for me to figure out who am I living for? Not what I am living for. To me, a what is not something to live for. Who? And the, what I realized was there are people who love me and who I love. And that was staying around for as long as possible. But to shape that journey, I had to also let the people I know love that I am going to try to stay around as long as possible, short of subjecting my mind, body, or spirit to torture. And that's been a real foundation stone for me in that. So I guess if I was going to look at what was really important to me, how has cancer affected me? It's given me a fierce determination, fiercer than I've had before, to remain label brawn throughout this whole experience. And that, it turns out, is not an easy task when you're dealing with something like this. Well, why not? I mean, what gets in the way of being labeled brawn in the cancer experience? First of all, it's other people's perception of you. Um, I don't talk much about my cancer. I'm glad to do it here, but I don't because that just, I think, lends itself to me see being seen as the loved one with cancer. That's not who I've been for most of my life. And I want to remain who I've been. I want to be that person who is present at the moment as the full me. Um, and I also don't want to deal with pity. That has never been something that's been high on my list. I don't think it's useful. Um, I'm dealing with this journey in the way that I deal with it. I have never been a fan of the militaristic language we use when dealing with events like this. Oh, you've got to fight the cancer. Oh, you got to conquer the cancer. Oh, the cancer's going down. You got this. I prefer when there are things in my life that come up that need my dealing with them to dance with it to see where it goes. Sometimes it leads, sometimes I lead, but what always remains is the dance. And that's what to me is being labeled wrong throughout this entire experience. So I wanna jump in here because I'm sitting here nodding my head so vigorously that I think my, my screen is actually bumping up and down. Yes, exactly. I want to show up as me. I don't want, I definitely don't want pity. There are too often people find out or they hear via the grapevine and then they run into me and wringing their hands. How are you? I just heard. I don't want any of that. Uh, my answer as honestly as I can in this moment, I am fine. Or in this moment, I'm facing a particular challenge and I'm managing it. That's where I go with it for that same reason. I love the idea. No, I hate the, the militaristic language. And I love the idea of dancing with it, whatever that means in the moment. To go back to what you were saying about wanting to show up as yourself. I just had a conversation with my husband probably about 10 days ago because the medications that I'm on, uh, sometimes I'm exhausted. Sometimes I'm not as clear-minded as I would like to be. And we had a date with somebody and I really didn't want to go. I was pushing really hard for his sake as much as anything else. And also to stay in the journey, to stay doing what I can for as long as I can. So I kind of pulled myself together and I got in the car and I was cranky. I was just cranky. I was tired. I wasn't thinking straight. And in that moment, I looked at him and I said, I am doing everything I know to do to show up with the four G's, gratitude, gusto, great grace. And there are moments where I can't access 
that part of me. I can't get to my heart. I can't get to my calm and centered self. I'm just too tired. I, I'm just too foggy. And I need you to know that in the moment. And remember that this is not all of who I am. Um, and so I set that up as a context for us. And now there's a shorthand to it. When we're going out, I will say to him in advance, um, I'm in a rough space right now. So you carry the conversation. I'll jump in when I can at dinner. And so he already knows up front. I may rally. Lots of things can happen and my energy goes up. But at least if he knows um, and then the people that I'm with know, when it drifts toward too much conversation about con cancer, I said, that's really not an interesting conversation right now. I'll answer what you need me to answer so that you're comfortable. But basically in this moment, I'm fine. And what do you think about? And I'll throw out another topic. That is so you mix. So you live life so honestly. And, you know, I wouldn't have expected that cancer could change that. And I think something that you and I have in common um, is we listen to our bodies in different ways, but we listen to our bodies. We don't try to force things on our bodies. We don't try to do things that our body's not ready to do. We do do things that our body is ready to do, whether our mind is ready to do them or not. And it's just a matter of, I, you know, I can't do this right now. And to to be able to say that and be heard is, I think, the greatest gift of those who love us in in our lives. Yes, and what I find is that I need to be clear enough. It's my responsibility to make the request. I mm -hmm. cannot expect in any part of a marriage, right, or in any part of a relationship that someone's reading my mind. Mm -hmm. And so it forces me, one of the gifts if you want to use that word of cancer, is that it forces me to be really clear and not assume that people know what's going on in my brain, because my brain's always doing what it's doing and running around in circles. But I need to be clear about what I want people to know so that we can be in our conversation in a way that's meaningful and loving and all of that. And you and I do that all the time, Label. We get on the phone kind of with no agenda. And two hours later, it's like, I think I need to go get a glass of water. And, you know, <laughs> you, you're talking about the assumptions that people make. Um, there's a funny story with you and I, and you'll know exactly which one I'm going for, which I think really points to this. Um, I am deaf in my right ear. And Minx and I were at a conference together and came time for the dinner. And um, I especially can't hear well when there's a lot of ambient noise or a band's playing right next to where we're sitting. Like at that time, you sat down next to me and I was really, really rude to you. I did not talk to you. I did not interact with you. I'm sure you thought I was the biggest jerk in the world, but you are also a very determined person. So the next year we're at the same conference and you sit down next to me and we have a fantastic conversation. And you say, well, what changed? Last year, I thought you weren't interested in talking with me at all. And this year we're having a great conversation. I thought back to the year before, oh, last year you sat down on this side this year you sat down on this side and that made all the difference in the world. So yeah. I think that people have their own assumptions about how we're dealing with cancer and cancer being almost a taboo subject in our, in our society. They're, they're unwilling to engage and ask, you know, well, were you, when you were really grumpy the other day, was it something I did or was it something that you weren't feeling well or something? People don't ask that. They just assume that it was because of the cancer and not defined by my cancer. Sometimes I get grumpy just because I get grumpy, you know? And uh, so it, 
I, I wish that people would open up to freely ask. That's the only antidote to the assumption for paradox. Well, I'm going to ask a question because of time and because of wanting to serve the world, um, which is which the three of us have as a goal. Um, what about the issue of mortality? Uh, there used to be a time when people said cancer, and that meant the end of everything. Doesn't mean that today. But still, when it comes to you, you have to sort of deal with the question of your own mortality. So I'm curious as to how the two of you have handled the question of death. For me, it becomes important to understand the nature of the universe we live in. I think it was Joseph Campbell who once said, um, you cannot live in concert with nature until you understand nature. And um, for me, one of the things that is deeply important to me is understanding that there were 13.5 billion years, give or take 200 million, before I showed up in existence. And that I have no fear about the fact that once there was a time without me before I was born, why should I have any fear that there'll be a time after that um, I won't be here? So, and as Mink said before, it helps me stay away from the why me thing because um, and we've had a conversation on this, Phyllis, about the four elements of the universe that people are most uncomfortable with. One of them is entropy. Things run down. Things end. Why me? Um, as Mink said, why not me? This is just part of a process. Okay, so for me, mortality has no meaning. It's not a factor in any of the decisions I make except making sure that those who will be here after I'm here are well taken care of for for the rest of their lifetimes. Mings? So I'm going to do a yes and because whenever label speaks that way, I just want to go yes, absolutely. And I'm going to take it to I'm going to take it down to a closer look at my own life. Um my mother died young. Uh, I have know way too many people who have died of cancer and have died young. So the first thing I wanted to be sure is that everybody who I knew who has impacted my life knew that, knows that, ongoingly knows that. So that was a piece of it. There is, there is nothing in my life, and this is a big statement to make, there is no one in my life that I love that doesn't know I love them at this point and way before right now, but ongoingly, I've been sending cards to people just because I moved to do that. I want people to know who they have been in my life as journey mates. So there's that piece there. I don't have any regrets. It's not that there aren't things that, gee, I wish I had done it that way or tried this or taken an extra trip to Europe or whatever it is, but I don't count them as regrets. I look at the absolute richness and blessings of my life. I have been writing down what I am grateful for ever since I took Martin Seligman's course 20 years ago, which he did for coaches. Every night you write down three blessings, three good things, uh, three things you're grateful for. So I've been doing that for 20 years. And you're not allowed to just write, I'm grateful for my son. I'm grateful for my son every day of my life. But today it's because he called right when I needed to hear his voice. So it's always very specific. So I have lived in this central place of gratitude as a core. And it changes everything. When I look at my life from that perspective, I have gotten to do so much. I have gotten to be so much. I have gotten to share with so many people that I'm not regretful in any way. Yeah, would I like to do it for 10 more years? Of course, sign me on. And if I don't, I leave the planet or this part of my existence. I don't know what the next part of my existence is without clinging or without 
having to say a thousand I'm sorry. I don't think there's anybody in my life that I now need, that I need to say I'm sorry to or clear something up that I haven't done already. Does that make sense? I think it makes a lot of sense. And I think it's something you don't just turn on when you find you get a di diagnosis that puts your life in, in jeopardy. It comes from how you live your life. And, um, and then just carrying that through to this next stage. Um, I think that if we want to prepare for death, it's not an exam that we start studying for the night before. Ask yourself what in your life you wish was different about how you being and how you're showing up in the world and start working on it now. Um, there's no guarantees in life. You, you don't know that you're going to get another chance to do it. Do it now. So I was very fortunate in that many, many years ago, I had access to a wonderful psychologist, happened to have been a child psychologist, which makes it much better because they talk back to you. It's You're not just talking at a, you know, someone who's sitting there nodding their head. And I was going through a difficult time because my mother was dying and she was pushing me away and I didn't understand it. So I asked him and he explains what happens and that sometimes at the end of life, you can't leave while you're still feeling connected to someone. And he gave me some suggestions. I went and had an amazing conversation, last conversation with my mother for hours, at the end of which time I gave her permission to, to die because in many ways she had stayed alive long enough for me. Mm -hmm. And she died the next day. So fast forward years later, I was having double hip replacements, which don't sound life-threatening, but you never know. I was trying to have a conversation with my son and my husband just in case. They wanted no, none of it. Didn't want to hear it, didn't want to listen to it, stop being so melodramatic, mom. So I wrote them each a letter. And I gave it to someone, it's still in a vault, um, just in case. I didn't want them to feel guilty afterwards that they never gave me a chance to say what I wanted to say. So those letters are still there. That started something in me of always being present. I've had too many friends who have died instantaneously or unexpectedly. So I live very much as if, if this is our last conversation, have I been fully present? Have I been totally... I'm connected in any way that I can be, because we never know. I think part of the barrier to having those conversations, as you just said, is when other people are uncomfortable with it and try to push it away. When the idea of you're not being around anymore is <laughs> is just too much for them to bear. And you've got to understand that and 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 and, you know, let them be how they are in the moment. But for me, a saying I love, it's purportedly an old Chinese saying that the cemetery is filled with indispensable people. I am not indispensable to anybody's life. Um, and so recently having a conversation with friends and I was talking about, you know, what my hopes are for Virginia after, and they didn't want to hear it. And so what often helps is humor. Um, I told I told them afterwards. First, I gave them a chance to just reset. I told them afterwards. I said, "Let me tell you a story about my mother. Uh, my mother died of ovarian cancer at the age of forty-three. And towards the end, she was totally bedridden, and her aunt, my great aunt, um, who was who was slowly dying of heart disease as well, came over to see her, and these two women who are approaching the end of their life, all of a sudden I hear from the bedroom where my mother was laying in one bed and her aunt was laying in the other bed, I hear this raucous laughter. And I go up to see what's going on, what's going on with this. They were discussing whether there would be pastrami in heaven because if not, they're not going. So um, that is in my family how we deal with this humor 
is a tool we use for everything. And um, once they understood where I was coming from with that, it was a lot easier. I mean, let's make this light. First of all, there's a chance I could be around for 30 years. Um, second of all, if I'm gone tomorrow, I'll have lived the life I was meant to live. And um, let's look at it with you. I love that. And you have, I think that I am drawn very often to people who have a great sense of humor because I grew up really serious for all kinds of really good reasons. Um, and finding my way to humor is um, has been a lifetime journey. I tend to be serious and I have to remember lighten up all, all the time. So there's that piece, but the other piece of it, which you and I both also do, I write poetry every day of my life. It's what I wake up, I open my journal. I, where am I today? What's, where's my, what did I, where am I meandering? So I will journal and I, and poetry. Well, right. I really say it falls on the page. It writes itself at that hour because I'm not coherent enough. And what it writes or what comes from wherever is a lot better than what I would write if I tried to follow the dots. And that, can you share? That, can you share one, Mix? I'm just picking one at random because I just opened a file and I don't even know. So this is April eighth, three years ago, and it's titled "Friends All Sorts." Well-meaning friends say you're strong and you've got this handled, and I love them for it. Good-hearted friends say you know how to beat this, and if anyone can, you can, and I appreciate them for it. Other friends who know me well say you'll sail through this and then you'll write about it, and perhaps I will. And then there are the friends who bring soup and make phone calls researching and locating resources so I don't have to. And I'm grateful beyond words. Loving friends who listen and offer no advice, who neither dismiss my fears nor scold me about my exhaustion, nor criticize my need to stay active. Life companions offering love and help and brings, um, offering love and help and bringing soup and washing the dishes, understanding friends who light candles and gather in prayer circles and send me pictures of their altars. And here I am in the midst of all this caring, held in the circle of their love, each offering what they can and in their own way. And I feel truly blessed. So what I would hope that people will really consider here is don't stop living your life before it's gone. Mm -hmm. Don't suddenly become somebody else. My experience with cancer is cancer tends to devour our lives before it ends it. And that's way too soon to have our life devoured. Be yourself, live yourself, enjoy, laugh, love. I know it sounds trite, but it really is what keeps me in the game. <laughs>